Welcome back to another Goldmark TV broadcast. As the, the sun comes out, we're starting to get this, the feeling of summer approaching. Um, I thought we'd have a look at some, some beautiful bright things today. We've got these fantastic slipware platters by Doug Fitch. We're going to have a little uh, uh, talk with him later about what goes into them and, and the very special history behind them. We're going to look at a, a really lovely sun-filled painting by Leonard Rosamond. And in just a minute, we're going to have a, a deep dive into the archives of Mabel Royds. That's not a name you've probably heard of, but it's one we'd like to introduce you to. I hope you enjoyed today. For a number of years now, Doug Fitch has been supplying the Goldmark Gallery exclusively with these wonderful slipware platters. They're beautiful to use. I've got one at home and I, it, it comes out every time. There's a big roast, a big spread out on the tables. But there's a really interesting history behind them as well, and in particular, behind the moulds that are used to make them. We chatted with Doug uh, and he uh, let us in on a little secret about where these platters came from. Uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation. So you're uh, based in Galloway, is that right? I've been up in... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, is, how has lockdown been for you? Because you're, you're fairly remote as it is, but I know you've got two lovely kids to, to look after at, at home. Well, really, it's been... I mean, apart from the obviously the terrible state of the world and, and, and the illness and the fact that we've all had the illness, yes. um, in many ways it's presented us with great opportunities because for a long time we've been working crazy hours because we have the kids at home with us as well in the workshop and, uh, and, and, we, and we both share the childcare. So we've been working crazy hours to fulfill all our, all our obligations and to get to the, the shows throughout the summer. And for a long time I've been saying to Hannah, we, we need to... Uh, Calm it down a bit. I can't. I'm an old man. I can't, <laughs> I can't keep doing these one o'clock in the mornings. Yeah. Um, and um, and so we, we need to calm it down, do a bit more online, take a chance, be brave. And, and, and so it's forced, forced that to happen, really. So um, uh, and in many ways, life hasn't changed because we live so remotely. Uh, we're 14 miles from the nearest town. And so we, we, we like to hide away in the sticks. It just means hiding away in the sticks for longer periods um yeah. and um yeah which is great and it's creating the opportunity for us to build a kiln here which which is something that we've we've been you know and to shoehorn into uh, yeah. our schedule so because as, yeah, I, as, I, as I understand you've had to you've had to travel to to fire before you, you've yes well um we are it's <laughs> our tales bit, it's, well, it's not complicated it's long and i'll cut it short but, but before Hannah and I got together I had a workshop in Devon and uh, and Hannah was up here in in Dumfries and Galloway um, and we got together and then uh, I ended up up here and Hannah had built a wood kiln about 25 miles from here where her workshop was and she lived a couple of miles from from the workshop well the people who had the workshop um, retired and sold up and and we grew and grew together and bought a house that had space to build a workshop at home and, and, we, and we moved home but we haven't had the time to move the kiln home so so the kiln is still 25 miles from here and it's small as well because it was Anna built it for yes her own pots not for me to come sticking you know, big jugs and, and things <laughs> in it so <laughs> so um, um so so that's where it is yeah and and that was fine when we when we just had one baby because we could we could take Pippin and she was fine there um, um, but but since we've had two to take two kiddies to the corner of a field for 20 hours at a time <laughs> for, not <laughs> ideal <laughs> no, not ideal so it's become increasingly difficult so um, um, as we've been gradually able to afford to do it we've developed a place here we just had a, a new kiln shed built a new kiln shed in the last three months um, and the materials are now arriving, the ballast and the concrete blocks and putting the foundation in and, and, and next week we start building the new kiln. So exciting. Um, we have a lot of help from a friend of ours, Alex McCurlane, who um, um, who's a who really actually taught Hannah, he's um, a great friend of ours, he always helps us fire the kiln and he's brilliant with plans. So he's been drawing up plans and sending them to us and you know, hopefully he might be able to come and put some bricks on the kiln. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll just keep him, um, you know, planning it. <laughs> Do the clever stuff. <laughs> yeah. So we're here today to talk specifically about some lovely platters that you make. I've got a couple with me here. This one, mm. 
I've just gone and stolen these from the pot shop. This one in particular caught my eye. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yes, so, that's the more recent one, that one. Yeah. So these have, a, have an interesting story to them, the, the, these series of patterns that you've, that you've been making. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 that one, um, well, I have the moulds that used to belong to, my, well, they were made by Michael Cardew. Um, I can show you. Would you like to see one? <laughs> <laughs> They are. <laughs> These are the moulds that were made by Michael Cardew um, that he used at, at Wenford Bridge. They made a fire clay. Um, shall I tell you the tale about how, yeah. they, how I came about? Yeah. Well, <laughs> again, it involves it involves our romance in that um, uh, we were we were looking for somewhere to set up a, a pottery. Um, um, as, as I said before, I was in Devon, Hannah was up here, so we didn't know whether we should work in Devon or whether we should um, work in, in Scotland, or whether we should work somewhere completely new. And um, a friend of mine lives a few hundred yards from Wentford Bridge Pottery, which by this time was derelict and defunct, um, and belonged to a, a local farmer who, who heard it for sale. He was selling the Cardi's old house and the workshop. Well, we, um, we, we, we went and had a look and thought, ah, if he would just sell us the workshop, we could make this work. This could be our new workplace. Um, the bottle kiln, part of the kiln was still there. Our plan was we'd make slipware, we'd fire it in the bottle kiln there, get the place up and running again. I mean, at, at the time, I was actually living in my shed down in Devon, uh, <laughs> rather illegally, like a hobbit. Uh, I'd gone and built a little uh, cottage illegally and I uh, was living in there. Uh, um, and uh, so I was a real catch for Hannah. And uh, um, so I, I was quite used to roughing it. So we were very prepared to, to do that. Uh, my friend was able to get hold of the key. Uh, and so we went in and had a look and, and most of it had been stripped out. Um, mm. There's still a couple of old wheels. I, I got one of the old kick wheels out of the workshop, but in, in the corner upstairs in what used to be um, the little museum, um, just covered in bat dudes and cobwebs was, uh, mm -hmm. These huge master molds for making these these these, um, uh, these dishes. So actually, I, I, yeah. The master mold. Show you as well. Oh, a this is one of the master molds that the wow. molds were made from. And you can see it on the. Oh yeah. yeah. In card use by hand. The dimensions on there. So there they were. And um, and a load of the molds. I then uh, got in touch with the owner and um, asked him. I asked him first of all if he'd sell me the pottery um, and um, we couldn't afford the house too but just sell me the pottery but he just said oh well you blooming potters you're just looking for a cheap property to live in it <laughs> uh, which was absolutely true um, so that didn't happen sadly even though we tried really hard to, to buy that um, but I did I was able to buy it by the moulds um, and um, so yeah so I've been making these pots from those moulds ever since um, yeah and do I understand some of them are some of them are from Cardi's moulds and some of them are your own that you've that you've um, yes the, the 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 squarer ones I mean there's, there's one of mine here this this these ones that come off these squarer ones were, were yes. our own moulds but but we, the Cardi moulds we have um, three three different shapes there's an oval one um, and two different rectangular ones um, yes there we go yeah. <laughs> <Lovely. laughs> um, <laughs> this is when I roast my potatoes and it, it had a it had a grip blow, so it never got sent. <laughs> They're great for roasting potatoes. And um, um, so yes, there are three there are three different shapes. There's an oval, two rectangles, in two different sizes. And the first dish that you showed was the larger size. Um, yes, which are much more difficult to make there because you have a big sheet of clay that you've got to yeah. To deal with, um, yeah, I, I was I was looking through. We have the instructions here. This is Cardew's oh wow uh, pottery book, and there's the whole section in here where it shows how these molds were made, and uh, it's like having an instruction book. Tells you how to do it. But he he was actually uh, the way that I I tend to do it is I decorate on a a flat slab, which is then left to homogenized and then draped over the top of the mold and trimmed up. 
Yes. His were made over the mould and then he would um, decorate inside. Uh -huh. I've got a couple of examples here. These, these were made, these were given to me recently. These, these were, sorry, they're very dusty. These were um, late examples. Oh, this, I think this is from, uh, this was bought in 1982, so it was the year before he died. Wow. Yeah. Um, but this was made um, off those mould. And, uh, and this one as well. So more of that oh. design. Um, dish that you showed this one waste of time. <laughs> the best dish that you showed was made off the same mould as as, um, as as this one. It's 1977. It's dated on the back. Wow. The year Hannah was born. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, now the last time I. Might... The last time I saw you decorating your uh, your moulds, you had um, a, a, what looked like a a reconstituted milk carton. It was, yes, it with was. a rather lovely goose goose quill from a, from is that Sidney Tustin, was it? Sid Tustin, yes, yeah. dear old Sid. Um, I used to go and visit Sid years ago and um, and film him, and and he would reminisce. Um, uh, Sid Tustin, of course, with Michael Cardew's first apprentice at Winchcombe in whenever it was, 1927, I think he first yeah. started. Um, and um, I used to go and visit Sid and film him. And, and he, uh, I have a lovely film of him decorating one of my plates, actually. That's the last thing that Sid ever decorated. Oh, wow. Plate. Terrible plate, beautifully decorated. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but he, um, he, he, he sort of be out some goose quills. So yeah, I, I got some tape and taped it all together in a milk carton. And, um, and made, a, <laughs> made a, a trailer somewhere here, and I can't see it. I brought a lot of stuff. The, the, my milk bottle trailer is yeah. stuck 25 miles away at the oh, right. place where, <laughs> where the kiln is. Uh, and in more recent times, I've been using um, this this pot, which is an oil. Oh, that's lovely. Um, an oil pourer by an American potter friend of ours called Dan Finnegan, um, who's in Virginia. And uh, so I converted that into a stuck of goose quill in that and, and converted it um, for, for pouring. But yeah, I need to go and get my milk carton back, really. <laughs> Very attached to that. <laughs> and the, do the designs, do they relate to things in, in particular? I, I always think when I look at them that they, they remind me of sort of um, sort of ploughed furrows in fields and very much that kind of that pattern that you get of... Uh, yes, absolutely, yeah. In fact, only yesterday we were looking at some ploughed furrows in the fields. Uh, and they, yeah, yes, absolutely. Ploughed furrows, the meandering rivers, um, all sorts. Um, and and they, I have another, another book here. They, they, the, the process was this, this is a book um, from the, the Pottery Museum, and these are some pots that we would very often visit when, when we oh, yes, yeah. go to Stoke. And these were done by the same, the same process, and these are 18th century ones. Um, so just by, by, by pouring them on. Yeah. I love the way that, um, you know, <laughs> that because a sheet of clay is draped over a mould and it's trimmed, most of the pattern's actually been trimmed away there. But, yeah. but yeah. lovely, there's a little hint at what was, <laughs> what was there. Um, so yeah, I mean, the countryside obviously is in everything that we do. I, I, I would think that if we were living in the middle of a city, Apart from the, you know, we couldn't fire a wood kiln, etc., etc. I think we'd probably be making very different kind of pots. Yes, but I think it's very unlikely we'd be living in the middle of a city as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to find out. <laughs> and what's what? What are the sort of difficulties with these? I, I think you, I think we we spoke about these a, a while ago, and you you mentioned that sometimes you have the the, the design is um, comes off on the on the mould, yeah. and you end up with yeah. it. Yes, it does. Um, in fact, I just noticed it when I went and quite You can see where that's that's happened on on here. The, 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 oh yeah, sticky slip surface as as I stuck to there, and that would have removed some of the, the design. Which sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it can just <laughs> destroy something you've been waiting for two or three days for. But but by the magic of technology, we've discovered that with a a hot paint stripper gun. You can, if you see any little shiny bits, you, you can. You can. And they'd have used a ye olde hot paint stripper gun, of course, in the yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Hopefully, rectified that. But uh, it's, it's a. 
timing is so critical with so much in pottery and particularly slipwear where you're dealing with stuff getting a little hard then you're yeah. putting a coat of wet slip over it and then letting that dry so much is, is about is, is about um critical timing and with these sheets of clay you have to catch them just right because and uh, and be so careful about drying them because they can dry around the edges and then become too crispy to put over the mold yes it'll be sticky in the middle if you're not careful so it's just a patience game really um and judging when it's just right um file in a lot of error <laughs> <laughs> and do you do you have to sort of get in the zone when you're decorating them because it's quite yeah. fast that, uh, yes precisely so yeah it's um it's um in a way it's, i'm a terrible dancer so it's pretty <laughs> but it is a bit like a dance you know you have to get in 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 the zone and in the rhythm you can't think about it too much because if you think about it you're going to go wrong you're going to go around too many times which doesn't matter too it makes it interesting but um but yes yeah yeah it, it sometimes it's a challenge with two small children running around i can imagine i can well imagine <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you for talking to us about these today doug it's been really kind of you and it's a uh, pleasure um it's a real delight to, to be able to handle them on this on this end as well well hopefully there'll be a whole stack more of them i've been say we're building a new kiln and I've been making goodness knows how many. There are a lot waiting to come, new ones to come. And then um, they'll be all going into the firing of the new kiln. So hopefully, if it's a good firing, we'll um, have some new ones for you. We, we will keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Bye-bye. I thought we would show you something slightly different today um, for today's broadcast. We're going to have a look through this lovely big tobacco uh, archive box of work by Mabel Royds. Mabel Royds is a name that you probably won't have heard of. She's one of um, many hundreds of thousands of women artists from uh, the late 19th and 20th century whose reputations for one reason or another have um, sort of gone unremembered. Um, whether that's because they were forced to, to give up their careers as artists, to, to look after their families, to look after their, their husbands and children, or those who, who stayed uh, unmarried and had very fruitful careers, then had nobody to leave their work behind to, and, and uh, their, their prints and drawings and paintings ended up getting dispersed by publishers, galleries, dealers. For many reasons, um, many of these uh, these artists have uh, have, um, have fallen by the wayside, and it's it's nice to be able to give a highlight to some of these careers and to 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 delve into some of the work that they they undertook. So today, Mabel Royds. As a sort of indication of how uh, Royds' reputation has been sort of subsumed a bit, um, she was married to a, to an artist, Ernest Lumsden, and uh, the largest body of her work is probably held in the Lumsden Archive in Edinburgh. Outside of that public collection, this is probably the largest collection of, of Mabel Royd's uh, work in existence. And what we're going to see today is really just the tip of our Mabel Royd's iceberg. There's many drawings here that I've, um, I've left out so that we've got time to, to go through what we have here. She was born in 1874 and um, at 15, she was a very precocious young artist. At 15, she was faced with a very difficult decision. She'd won a scholarship to the Royal Academy, and she was battling with whether she was going to accept that position or whether she was going to go to the more radical Slade School at the time. That decision that she had to make really reflects um, how different the two schools were at the time. Uh, at the Royal Academy, um, not particularly well known for its treatment of, of young women artists at the time. Women artists weren't allowed to draw from the nude model until 1903 at the Royal Academy. Uh, and at the time that Royds was thinking about applying, I think only a fifth of the members there were women and they were, they were referred to by one particularly pig-headed academician as the female invasion. Compare that to the Slade School, um, much more forward thinking. At the, the Royal Academy, people tended to, to have to draw from the antique, which was uh, from old sculpture, from plaster casts and, and, and marble statuary. Whereas at the Slade, life drawing is very much encouraged. And a lot of that came under uh, the tutelage of Henry Tonks. He was an ex-army surgeon, uh, an anatomical draftsman of uh, extraordinarily exacting standards. 
and he introduced a whole new philosophy of, of life drawing at the Slade School. It relied very much on um, speed, on concision, on getting down line first and then filling in the volume afterwards, compared to the very slow shading and stub work and, and blending of surfaces that you get with, uh, with sort of traditional life drawing. You can see that in, that's one of my favourite drawings, this we've just come to here. You can see that in the, the speed, uh, the confidence uh, with which some of these drawings have, have been done and the very light shading and highlighting with this sort of, this white pencil. That teaching at the Slade School, she was, Mabel Royds was one of many young female artists to, to, um, to benefit from, from Tonk's uh, teachings. Uh, people like Gwen John, Winifred Knights, Edna Clark Hall, uh, Vanessa Bell, they all, all were, were, were part of that sort of, that sort of cohort. Um, in fact, when Royds was there, two thirds of the, of the year uh, that she was part of were, were young women artists. And the teachings from Tonks really stayed with her throughout her life. You'll see that sort of, that vigour, that, that, um, that sort of uh, quickness of expression in these drawings as we go through. I like the dynamism of some of these, these drawings, the sort of very quick discovering of shapes and forms. You can see that in some of these lines, these lines here that have just been quickly put down to, to sort of quickly search for, feeling for, for the shape of the, the curve of the, of the body in its pose. Very quickly, very deftly put together. Look at that, this is a lovely one. Some of the very best, some of the very best known images that Mabel Royds made were uh, in India uh, on her travels there. After her studies at the Slade, she went on to become a teacher in Toronto briefly, and then in, in 1907, uh, around 1908, she worked. Uh, she took a post at the um, uh, Edinburgh School of Art, and it was there that she met Ernest Lums Lumsden, who was to, to become her, her future husband. Lumsden was a, a star etcher in the making at the time. Um, and he quickly, uh, around 1911, I think, left his post. Um, they were both teaching in the, the painting and drawing department. He left to, um, to journey to India to start a, a, a sort of um, a, a career as a, as a, as a, um, a documenter, a recorder of, of, um, of the, the sort of colonial uh, spaces in, in, uh, across India. In 1913, they, they honeymooned there together and they spent uh, the war, uh, Lumsden was declared medically unfit during the, the First World War and so they spent a lot of their time there uh, journeying around um, Benares, uh, Rajasthan uh, as, it was, as it was then known and then uh, further north into Ladakh into towards the sort of the border of uh, Himalayan border with Tibet. In fact, there you go, that's probably a portrait of Lumsden right there, sketching one on there, on their travels. There was really a, a, an appetite at the time for um, images of, of the Orient, of um, uh, a, a demand for sort of uh, a colonial reports back from the from the front line, from uh, sort of how the how the, the colonies were going on, the sort of exotic goings on uh, at the edges of the empire. Royds and Lumsden managed to sort of avoid. Um, sentimentalizing or, or, um, or sort of uh, the jingoistic uh, side of things. Uh, many of the artists who provided images at that time of the sort of, uh, of oriental uh, interest had never actually been to the countries they were, they were portraying. Um, compare that with some of the, the beautiful realism in, in, in Royds and Lumsden's work. They zero in, zeroed in on uh, India as a, a country of, of contrast, of, of huge uh, change at the time, balancing sort of uh, industrial growth, uh, the, the imposition of the, of, um, of the British Empire on, 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 its, on its sort of manufacturing, its industry, and its, um, its agriculture, its, its labourers, its craftsmen. It's a, a country of um, extraordinary action and movement. Everything is, 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 is going on, and that's, that's the scene that, that, uh, that Mabel Royds brought back with her.
it was on an extended trip for sort of two years that they, that they journeyed to Ladakh, which is a, a very remote part of, the, the, of northern India, uh, right on the Tibetan border. It's a very harsh climate, very cold, with these beautiful cities and, and temples perched up in the cliff tops. You can see that in some of these, these sketches that I'm showing here. And really, this, this particular um, journey opened to her a, a sort of a wealth of, of, of cultural difference of which she, she had no idea. He gets some of that idea of, of an India, India of contrast in the back these great big grand projects, and here a much more sort of rural setting, these two bridges in contrast. It must have been a, a, a fairly grueling time for them, uh, as well as exciting for as artists. Um, they were, they were um, moving all across the country uh, in its extraordinary heat with large amounts of equipment. And India itself must have offered a, such a huge wealth of things to, to look at, such a, a range of uh, a variety of, of different um, aspects and, and uh, activities going on. Um, you can get a feeling for that in these, these sketches, these different sort of marketplaces and, 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 uh, and piers and, and sort of ponds. But Mabel Royds in particular took a real interest in the people that she saw around her. She made a number of very sort of um, vivid sketches of labourers in different sort of poses and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and movements. I think she enjoyed the, the different shapes that, that these sort of young Indian labourers' bodies made, these sort of long, slender limbs perched back on their haunches, sort of squatting, and beautiful portraits of, of people in the, in, the, in the town. Musicians feature quite frequently. There you've got a nice pair with their string instruments. And of course the many temples monks. You can probably see just about on this uh, drawing notes on colours here. We've got purple, uh, marigold, yellow, black, blue and grey blue. A lot of these sketches that she was making would have been uh, made up into prints when she returned from her travels. So these were the notes for her for for uh, sketching up her designs onto, onto wood blocks for making woodcut prints. I think some of the nicest drawings are among these little these portraits of these members of, uh, members of society. I think they're really beautifully captured in just a few, few sort of strokes of the pencil. She gets a real sense of character from them. That's as strong as any sort of photojournalist's portrait of the last 50, 60 years. Maybe she would, would have been a, a member of Magnum if she'd lived 50 years later. And in particular, she, I think, had a real affinity for mothers and children, and children in particular. She had a real um, compassion and empathy for them. She actually had children quite late in her life, in her, in her 40s, after she returned from, from her, from her travelling. But her, her drawings of, of young children, um, particularly in, in, in Ladakh, in this very remote, distant region, are really beautifully expressed. There's a couple here that I, I, I think are, are, are um, really beguiling. This lovely lady, who she sketched a number of times, actually. And I love the weight of this baby in the crook of her, her arm. These are traditional Ladakhi uh, women. They're wearing a, 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 this is a, a headdress called a perak. 
it's very sort of noticeable shape. And they crop up a number of times in these sketches. Here's one of my favorites, look. In full traditional dress. One of the other things that must have caught Mabel Royd's eye as she was uh, uh, traveling around India was the, uh, the local art, the art of, um, of the temples, of, of the murals she saw around her. Uh, she made a number of these very brightly colored designs after murals that she saw in temples. There's a lovely one up here. Often these are double-sided because these are working sketches so you can see some of the different motifs she was noting. Interestingly, one of the comments that um, Ernest Lumsden made about India w was about its colour. Um, he remarked that uh, um, people seem to have this idea that India was a, a, a place of um, extraordinary, primary, bright, vibrant colour, uh, which it is, but actually, as a painter, it's very difficult to get that across, he said, because um, the light is so bright, it's so strong, and the heat is so strong, that it tends to bleach a lot of that colour. And, and those that it doesn't bleach, it, it envelops with such a, a heavy context of, of light around it that it becomes very difficult. Everything's very haloed. So actually a lot of the colour um, was probably um, remembered. It was probably uh, either, either remembered uh, uh, when Mabel Royds came back from her journeys, um, or it was inspired by some of the colours that she'd seen firsthand, the spices and the cloths. Also this beautiful sandstone, this pink sandstone, which seems to appear in some of the, cut, uh, the woodcuts that we'll see in, in a minute. Here's one of my favorite designs. This is a potter working with clay here, you can see. And again, these notes at the top, too narrow, flesh too yellow, too light. And if we look in this next folder, we can see some of the, um, the woodcuts that Mabel Royds made. It was really a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a printmaker that her, her reputation has grown uh, and, and been maintained. And as we'll see, uh, uh, she was an extraordinarily experimental uh, printmaker. She, she worked mainly as a, as a, in woodcut, uh, in, in colour, uh, and the colours vary hugely across what she did. She was, they, they lived pretty much in, 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 um, in sort of uh, fairly tight means for, the, for most of their lives. Um, Royds had to resort to buying sixpenny uh, breadboards from Woolworths to, to make her woodcuts on. She couldn't afford sort of uh, the traditional pear blocks or hardwood blocks. Um, so they're very sort of, uh, they have a sort of rough and ready feel, but there's a beautiful variety in the different, um, uh, the different impressions. She was always uh, changing her blocks. She was uh, reworking bits, uh, cutting out some sections and plugging them. That's when if a particular area is not working, you try and sort of score it out and then replace a, a piece of wood that's the same shape, same size, to, to plug in to rework a design. But you can see in some of these that the variety in, in, in colour across the same print, this is the knife grinder, is huge in these yellows, in the shadows across here, in this colour. Much of this would have been sort of almost uh, burnished on uh, by hand, much like um, Japanese, traditional Japanese printmaking, which is why you, you're able to get these different variations in tone. Here's another one, the market, with this lovely big negative space here. You can see that the difference between these two prints is huge, the difference in colour, 
some of the lines registering on one on the other. Extra shadows. And then another of, of Mabel Royd's passions was, was flowers, was, was still lives of, of flowers, often in, in, a, in a style that's very much reminiscent of, of, um, of Japanese printmaking. You can see these two, these are probably sort of working proofs, working towards a final, a final image. Look how different that, that background colour is though, from the yellow to, the, to this almost lime green. It's amazing how these different variations in colour, in, in, in depth of tone and, and, and how uniform the ink is across the, the, the block, give the same print a completely different feel. And of course, like many, uh, like many artists of the time, there's religious symbolism as well. I like the way in these, uh, these images of, of, of Christ, actually, that you can see Royd's time abroad has sort of influenced her idea of what Christ probably would have looked like. This is a very far cry from your, your normal Western uh, uh, ideal of the figure with, his, with light hair. This is a much more, um, this is much closer to a, 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 a Christ figure from, um, from the East. As a young female artist, uh, India really gave Mabel Royds an, an opportunity to, to um, break out of the ordinary sphere of what was expected of, a, of, a, of, of, a, of women artists at the time in terms of their, their subject matter. Um, but she was, uh, on her return from, from India, she did engage in, in the sort of subjects that it was often expected of, of women artists. But with a very uh, expressive and, and, and sort of vigorous approach, uh, much like those, those uh, figure drawings that we saw earlier. We've got a series of different plant studies here. And I think her sense of colour must have been influenced or, or, or uh, inspired by some of the colours that she saw uh, in India. There's a sort of real strength, a real, um, a real sort of almost uh, sour tang to the, to, the, to the paints that she chose for um, plants even on her return. You can see that's still the same kind of searching for form, that, that, that quickness, trying to capture the subject with speed and, and accuracy in some of these studies with the shading that's quite sort of limited, quite, quite loosely done. Well, it looks like some, maybe some fox gloves there. And then, of course, she brought back with her those um, scenes of the plants, uh, the, the wildlife, the, the, the vegetation that she'd, that she'd seen in India. So we get these prickly pears uh, recurring, which feature in some of the prints, too. You'll see some up here. These big sort of yucca-like plants and trees. Some lovely gnarled roots there. And then some of my favourites are these sun sunflowers with these wonderful drooping heads that must have really captured her. She, she made a number of sketches of these in different positions. Sunflowers, of course, have got such a sort of rich, rich painterly history to them from, from Van Dyck to, to Van Gogh. And in fact, back here, they made it into a rather lovely oil, very much of its time in terms of its color and form, these lovely sort of violets and blues and greens. It sort of looks quite 
inspired by uh, the sort of uh, those paintings by Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell from the, from the Bloomsbury period. This lovely drooping big head here. There were obviously other subjects that she took on, animal studies. We've got a number of interesting things here. Animals around the farm, goats. Cockerels. These fantastic postures. Geese and ducks. Donkeys and horses. Cows, I particularly like these. They've got a lovely sense of form about them, I think. But throughout her career, it was really India that keeps coming back, that keeps informing, even years past their, their last visit. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, it remained important to her. You can see that in these camel studies. The number of them compared to these other animals. By keeping India uh, in her sights, even uh, decades past that last visit in 1917, Mabel Royds managed to sort of keep her, her, her interest, keep her, uh, her, her popular appeal away from just the domestic subjects that, that um, would have been expected of her. But in many ways, that was also a, a, a sphere to which she, she returned and which she was constrained by as a, as a mother in her later life. And their, their, um, their lack of means as a couple. And really, it's children, I think, that are the enduring, enduring subject of her, of her work. She seemed to have really understood them, understood not just their, their postures and the, the shapes that they make, but also their behaviours and their, their interests. And some of these sketches, particularly of toddlers, there's a real sort of, um, a real close observation of, of that kind of, uh, that openness that children have and their curiosity and the strange way that their slightly different proportions affect their bodies. Even a little slight sketch like that look, with only a few pencil marks, that's exactly the sort of movement, the sort of position that these young children take. I suppose really what her art was about was, was portraiture was about people and no matter what that environment is what that atmosphere is what their background their age it was about capturing them in their their natural habitat something quite oddly moving about going through an archive like this where you're not just uh, you're not just looking at the, the the masterpieces you're not just looking at the the finished works that you're sort of it's almost like opening someone's diary seeing not only how someone's thinking and working but also the sort of the day-to-day -day sites that they they must have encountered and the 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 way that they've tried to approach those different subjects there's a lovely series here of hand studies that Reuters undertook. And 
On the surface of it, these are just technical drawings. They're about trying to become a better artist, about understanding the movement of the hand, one of the most complex shapes, the most complex uh, sources of, of, of mechanical human behaviour that an artist has to deal with. But at the same time, there's something quite touching about these different positions and the people who she's obviously been observing in these sort of little snapshots of, of time. I particularly like this one of a, a woman who looks like maybe she's sewing. Even in just these hands, you get a feel for what these people are, are like and what they're doing, what their lives have entailed. And something that I find it strange to, to think about is that these were all real people. These were people who were living 100 years ago. And they're right there on the page. And it's not just them, it's their, it's their character, their, their essence is right there in front of you. Look at this series of portraits of this old lady, look. With these little sort of pince-nez glasses perched on the tip of her nose. She seemed so real and, and of course she was. She's one of the many sitters that Royds took the time to put down on paper. And here we are, a hundred years later, 120 years later, looking at them and wondering about what their lives entailed and what their, their stories were. That's what's so fascinating about having an archive like this and being able to, to, to sift through it as we have today. And it's also why artists like Mabel Royds, who um, operated at the margins and, and uh, have been unfairly left out of the, the limelight, deserve that, that chance, deserve that time. Because we get not just a window into their lives and the, the art that they made, but also these, these countless people who surrounded them. It's a, it's a wonderful human document that she leaves behind her. And I hope you've enjoyed sharing that with me today. This strange sun-split painting is by Leonard Rosamond. And Rosamond was, I think, a really interesting artist. He was a Royal Academician, and he had a particular way of looking at the world. Every one of his paintings has this kind of strange super-saturation, as if whatever scene he was looking at, no matter how ordinary or everyday, it kind of uh, it involved in his head and, 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 and warped into a, some sort of strange hallucinatory dream. This was painted, we think, maybe in the 1970s, the early 1970s. At the time, Rosamond was newly divorced and he was embarking on a new relationship with the pianist Roxanne Rubel. They decided to travel together to Greece. Uh, they went to Corfu first, then Vuliameni, and then in Crete. And Crete especially fascinated Rosamond, the, the, the strength of the light, the colours, the gaggles of tourists walking around these sort of very, uh, very sort of violent, uh, rough cliff, cliff top areas. They took a, a small summer house together on the top of the cliffs where they could see the, the sea out crashing against the island. And the place began to have a kind of significance. It kind of prompted these strange visions for Rosamond. He started to imagine weird palatial assaults on the, on the house. And he and Roxanne became in his eyes almost sort of Odyssean figures, Odysseus crashing against the rocks. He made a number of paintings after this journey, imagining himself as a kind of Odyssean figure hurled up against the, the, the cliff tops uh, and Roxanne there in the, in the, um, the flat in the, in the house on, on the cliffs. You see one of the effects that he picked up when he was staying in this house 
one of the things that he'd noticed was the light streaming through the blinds, sort of prying between the slats. And that's what you get in this painting, you get this strange effect across the sky. It's almost like the sun has sort of split it and it's come through and it's spilling across this vista, down onto the landscape below, onto her and the chair. It's even cracking and making these strange symbols, which almost look like letters from some sort of unknown alphabet. This beautiful sort of jewel-like palette is very much of Rosamond's style, these sort of azures and ambers and jades. But they were kind of enhanced by the, the trip to Greece, by this intense heat, this intense light that sort of irradiates this experience for him. It's a very strange painting. It reminds me of uh, those sort of late paintings of Goya, this, th those vast landscapes with, with figures doing strange things in the middle of them. We're not quite sure who this might be. Perhaps this is Roxanne sitting here on her chair. But it's a painting that encapsulates a very private moment, a very private holiday, a, 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 a private sort of communion between the two, and a very private experience of this this heat swirling, this feeling of the, the mythic ancient history of Crete sort of baking through the island, baking through the land. It's a very strange but I think very beautiful painting. educate, entertain our customers. OK, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. He's thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. But there's nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery. Mm -hmm. 